Good morning, everyone, both here and on Zoom. We're so glad that Rick's wife and his brother are able to join us on Zoom. It's a real treat for them, and I said maybe they'll, his brother anyway, will have some surprises. <laughs> um, these adventures in living are surprising and very rewarding, so I hope you'll enjoy this one today. Uh, it's Rick Gold, who moved to Gainesville in 2014, along with his wife, daughter, son, and dog. One of his objectives in moving here was to participate in the Institute in Learning in Retirement, the ILR. In addition to facilitating several courses, attending dozens of them, and asking hundreds of questions, he's a, mem he's a member of the ILR board. He's also the chair of the curriculum committee, which is responsible for organizing the ILR courses. And I can testify as a member of the Humanities Curriculum Committee that sometimes Rick's task is like herding cats. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he accomplishes it with quiet skill and tact. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Thanks for coming. So um, the, uh, several years ago, I was at uh, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C., and there was an exhibit section dealing with Peace Corps volunteers. And they put on presentations about their lives and their work in different countries. And I went up to one of them and I said, when you're with your friends and family, how long can they listen to your stories about what you did in the, in the Peace Corps? He said, maximum five minutes. So I'm going to be speaking to you for a, a bit more than five minutes today about uh, countries that some of you are quite unfamiliar with. But I think that you're going to appreciate uh, being uh, informed, inspired, and perhaps even provoked. So there are many sides to my life. Uh, I wanted to share with you how my commitment to social justice and holding institutions accountable developed and how it was reflected in my work and activism. Yeah. We're gonna start uh, before I was born. I was born in Baltimore, and um, Baltimore is a city that was a victim of redlining. And redlining, that many of you know, is uh, a process where uh, the, uh, the banks decide who's going to live where, depending upon the so-called uh, desirability of neighborhoods. And so it was in the 1930s, and this is a map of Baltimore 1937, uh, where the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, instituted redlining, and it denied investment in neighborhoods that were so-called high risk. But this risk was based generally on race and ethnicity. And members of minority groups were unable to secure housing loans outside of specific neighborhoods. And that basically determined how Baltimore was broken up, uh, black, white, and different groups. And it also determined where the Jewish community lived. And so I lived in, I grew up in an almost 100% Jewish community in the Pikesville area, northwest of Baltimore. Um, and um, that was because of redlining. In addition, uh, there was uh, uh, Jim Crow. There were Jim Crow laws on the books uh, that uh, made it quite difficult uh, for uh, blacks to, to live in the area. Uh, schools were segregated in the 40s. Interracial marriage was illegal. Uh, playgrounds, public parks, uh, swimming pools, uh, and other recreational facilities were segregated. And blacks couldn't be firefighters, 
taxi cab drivers or city bus drivers. But by the end of 1955, after Brown versus Board of Education uh, went through at the Supreme Court, uh, Jim Crow was sort of not as pervasive as it was. Uh, there were desegregated schools. Uh, many of the pharmacies' uh, lunch counters were desegregated. Uh, and de but department stores still were segregated, uh, <clears throat> as well as restaurants, movie theaters, and hotels. Uh, a, a public accommodations law was passed in 1962, which made Jim Crow illegal. And incredible activism, sit-ins, protests, really contributed to this. There also were many, many years of lobbying by groups like the NAACP, uh, the Urban League, religious leaders, labor leaders, etc. And so uh, that's kind of what uh, I grew up in. Uh, so let's try the next one. Good. Tell you a little bit about my family. This is my mother and father. Uh, when they were at my wedding in Morocco in 1992. My mother was a uh, specialist in dyslexia. She had a PhD in education. She taught in Baltimore inner city schools for a while. Uh, she was a professor, professor of English at the Community College of Baltimore, where she taught African-American literature women and women's literature uh, as well as remedial reading for college students. And um, she also was a, a teacher at uh, a Reformed Jewish uh, congregation, Baltimore Hebrew, where I uh, was brought up. My father was a tax lawyer at the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and um, he had some notable accomplishments. Uh, first of all, he helped prevent uh, the Church of Scientology from regaining its tax exempt status, which had been removed in 1967. That didn't last, uh, through dirty tricks, they did manage to get it back. Uh, in 1975, he volunteered to join President Ford's Presidential Clemency Board, which was uh, set up to heal some of the divisions of the Vietnam War. Um, the board reviewed the cases of over 14,000 persons charged or convicted with draft evasion and desertion. As a result of the work, more than four out of five applicants received pardons, and less than 10% were denied clemency, and the others uh, received alternative service. Uh, my father uh, remarried after the death of my mother with Stella Gold, and she is a forensic handwriting specialist. Uh, in addition, she does has done consulting for human resource departments at companies. Uh, her One of her minor claim to fame is that she linked to the analysis of handwriting to the Meyer Briggs personality test, and that allows her to determine just through handwriting how reliable an employee might be. So. And this is my brother, Brett. He retired as a tax lawyer, like his father, in New York uh, to pursue an interest in composing and performing jazz music, as well as other things. But And here's my family, immediate family, uh, my wife, Bushra, uh, my daughter, Sarah, my son, Adam, and Bagans. Uh, my wife uh, was a Ministry of Interior employee when I met her in Morocco. And uh, wherever she goes, she's famous for her cooking of not only Moroccan food, but all other types of food. And my daughter, Sarah, is uh, currently a communication specialist with the International Organization of Migration in Erbil, Iraq, the Kurdish area. Uh, my son, Adam, is an assistant preschool teacher. Uh, he's a college student studying 
early childhood education. And he also is a very strong autism advocate. And he does that through social media, through a, a very active Instagram account. So a little bit more about Baltimore. Uh, there was a, uh, a there was a segregated amusement park called Gwyn Oak, uh, and there the community uh, fought to desegregate it uh, from 1955 to 1963. All types of of people uh, advocated, uh, protested, marched to remove the. Uh, de to remove the segregation. Uh, but on July 4th, 1963, 283 people were arrested and charged with trespassing outside the park during a protest by those who uh, were outraged over its refusal to admit African Americans. Uh, the desegregation they were successful and desegregation took place in August 28th, 1963. Um, but the, 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 car, the park ended up cl um, closing in the early 70s due to destruction by a hurricane. And the um, carousel today is now found on the National Mall. So if you go to Washington, DC, that's the Winnow uh, Carousel. In June, 1963, the Central Conference of American Rabbis asked Jewish congregations to make an all out effort to support civil rights. And one supporter was Baltimore's Interfaith Committee on Human Rights, of which Baltimore Hebrew Congregation's Rabbi Morris Lieberman was an active member. Rabbi Lieberman was one of the many uh, clergy arrested at the protest. When a reporter asked him why he joined other clergy to be arrested, he smiled and said, I think every American should celebrate the 4th of July. Among the white participants was a woman named Lois Feinblatt and other members of the Civil Rights Committee of Baltimore Hebrew Congregation. She said, our Rabbi Morris Lieberman was very active in civil rights and he encouraged members of the congregation to go. He was a fabulous religious leader who inspired people to get out there and do something to put Jewish principles into action. A couple of other, a few other people at attending uh, this protest were Michael Schwerner, Schwerner, who would go on to join the Freedom Riders and was one of the three Congress of Racial Equality Civil Rights workers killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi by the Ku Klux Klan. Another, other participants were uh, activist, uh, left, uh, Jewish activist, Arthur Waskow, who's now one of the uh, people who has filed a, a case against the 15 week abortion ban in Florida because of religious freedom purposes, uh, as well as uh, student for De Democratic Society President, Todd Glick Gitlin, and both of them are in this, uh, I think I can, laser, in this photo here. In addition, there, there are um, uh, William Sloan Kaufman over here. Here's a bus uh, where uh, the clergy leaders are being taken to prison. And I ended up, uh, my mother was very committed to the struggle, and uh, the first day that uh, Gwyn Oak desegregated, she brought me there. Uh, Gwyn Oak also appears in the 1988 film Hairspray, which was produced and directed by Baltimorean John Waters, who's famed for his black humor films like Pink Flamingos and more mainstream films like Polyester. So this film includes a scene of a civil rights demonstration where um, the Corny Collins dance show is filmed at the Tilted Acres Amusement Park, which is a pseudonym for Gwyn Oak, and is based on the protests that took place at Gwyn Oak. And you'll see on the right, uh, 
uh, the main character, one of the main characters, uh, uh, divine, a uh, transsexual, uh, as, as well as her daughter in the uh, in the film played by Ricky Lake. I don't know why this comes out sideways, but uh, in I was a member of the the Boy Scouts. I was sponsored by uh, the uh, Baltimore Hebrew Congregation, uh, and uh, one of our scout leaders was uh, named uh, Jacob Beezer, and he was uh, a radar technician on both the Enola Gay, which you see here, and the boxcar, uh, which dropped the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he was very proud of what he'd done. He said, given the same set of circumstances that existed in 1945, I would not hesitate to take part in another similar mission. I feel no sorrow or remorse for whatever small role I played. I don't want to hear any discussion of morality. War, by its very nature, is immoral. Are you any more dead from an atomic bomb than from a conventional bomb? And some of his uh, kids put together a foundation after he died to, to basically share uh, Jake's a perspective on the bomb. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable with that at all. I thought that uh, civilians uh, didn't need to die in such great numbers. But, you know, it became a very interesting issue as I grew up. In 1968, uh, I was uh, bar mitzvahed, and uh, the, one of the readings that I uh, had to do had to do with um, uh, the rebellion of the Israelites against uh, Moses uh, because they just were sick of being stuck in the desert. And so Rabbi Lieberman, who uh, uh, went to jail for Gwinnock, uh, presided over my bar mitzvah. And... Uh, the statement that I made in the speech was uh, that uh, if I were faced with with situations with, that I found unacceptable, I probably would rebel, but only after studying them for a while. So. As I moved into junior high school, uh, one of the uh, activities I participated in was a demonstration against uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, my father uh, signed a slip that said that I could go downtown and join the march. Uh, it was a march against uh, paying taxes for the war because uh, Lyndon Johnson had signed a, a law that added a 7.5% surcharge to income tax pill, bills specifically for the war. So it was right across from the Internal Revenue Service building and... Uh, I just thought it was kind of interesting or ironic that I was protesting at the same building where my father was working, and he signed the slip for that so that I could attend. Also, uh, in ninth grade, I was taking a class on physics, uh, and uh, the teacher said uh, as, as an assignment that each of the students must write to a, a congressperson and uh, asked uh, to share their perspectives or to ask for some action. So I wrote to a congressman asking for a bill that legalize, legalizes all types of consensual sex between adults. And when the teacher heard about that, he called me a pervert. In uh, 1970, uh, my parents paid for me to join a trip to Europe, uh, and uh, it was a student group, but it also was the opportunity for a graduate student at Clark University to do a uh, thesis on um, psychogeography, cognitive mapping. And so as part of that, he asked the students to, uh, to, tell, to put together maps of the cities, that they visited. And one of the assignments uh, was uh, to put together a map of an ideal city. 
And so he included this map from me in his uh, thesis. Uh, he, he gave me a pseudonym, da pseudonym, David Abrams, but nevertheless, uh, that's me, or that's my, my map. And um, during the trip, uh, one night we went to a discotheque and he got very drunk and uh, extremely politically conservative uh, me um, uh, member of the group uh, decided to tell on him. And so uh, he was asked to leave. Uh, but the rest of us uh, decided that we would have a vigil in the tour director's office. And uh, it didn't help, but nevertheless, it was a taste of what might of what was to come. I was uh, in high school, uh, you can see me here, uh, and um, this is a picture of the film society that my brother Brett uh, presided over. Uh, and um, in high school, one of my uh, political activities was to stick up for the rights of smokers. I was not a smoker, but I hated going to the bathrooms and it was with all the smoke there. So I wanted to support them and I went out and joined a rally of, sm of smokers who wanted to get a smoker's lounge. Never happened, but <laughs> nevertheless. Also in high school, uh, I took a class on writing at a local community college and I still have this uh, this uh, paper I wrote on abortion reform and what would be necessary to legalize abortion. And I'm saying that uh, survival should trump morals, that, can, we, that the Catholic Church is, is, is a major blockage for the legalization and of, uh, of abortion. Teacher didn't like exact uh, my words, but I think she appreciated the fact that I was addressing an important subject. In, uh, I went on to Brandeis University in Boston. It's a non-sectarian university founded by the Jewish community in 1948 as a haven for those who faced discrimination, couldn't find jobs uh, in other universities. Uh, I studied biology. Uh, I did a, I focused particularly on environmental studies and green lifestyles. Uh, in the end, I, I took a lot of, a couple of courses on nutrition, and I was very interested in the politics of food, as well as the potential use of food as a political weapon. One of my activities in, at Brandeis was to um, join a, a campaign for the bottle bill. In other words, to getting reimbursement for bottles that are returned uh, for cleaning. Uh, this again was unsuccessful. Uh, there was uh, some dirty tricks by the bottling company employees, uh, but nevertheless, the Massachusetts has a bottle bill today. And so uh, I can take partial credit for that. So this is me as a senior at Brandeis uh, and one of the activities that the students uh, were particularly concerned about was uh, the uh, support for minority students. Uh, and they formed a group called the Student Action Group that, that listed demands, including, uh, inclu including uh, Asian Americans in the minority financial aid pool, uh, an end to faculty layoffs, uh, reversing cuts to the uh, the program that uh, supported uh, minor minorities transitioning to uh, uh, Brandeis, et cetera. And so one of the activities was to take over the sociology building and um, about uh, 28 people occupied it. And uh, I was one of the people outside who were supporting the, the uh, protesters. Eventually they had brought in 28 people who mixed with them so that they all came out. So they couldn't, the authorities couldn't say, couldn't determine who was actually occupying. Also during college, I participated in a couple of uh, rallies of the People's Bicentennial Commission. Uh, and if you notice, uh, 
they have the same uh, don't tread on me uh, symbol as the Tea Party, uh, and but there it was more of a left focus. Their, their concept was economic revolution. And so you see, send a message to Wall Street. So the, I attended uh, the, uh, the rallies in Concord, Massachusetts, as well as Washington, DC. Also, I attended a, uh, I met up with uh, the, uh, a group that is, uh, was putting together a walk across the United States that's focusing on disarmament, disarmament and social justice. So I went on a bus trip from the East Coast to the West Coast and I found them in St. Louis uh, and joined them. One of the, the activities they did in St. Louis was they, uh, they participated in a rally against the closure of a hospital in a black neighborhood. And also they had a, a seminar on uh, the conversion of military industry to alternative production. I also went to a training on how to be an activist dealing with food and hunger issues in Washington, D.C. And um, as part of that, I did a, uh, an internship at the Friends Committee for National Legislation in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then when I went back to Brandeis, I established a group that focused on uh, hunger action. Uh, and uh, in addition, during uh, the, uh, uh, the bicentennial year, uh, I protested uh, one of the tall ships that came to Baltimore as a uh, part of the festivities. And this one was from Chile. And um, it was uh, we, the protest was because the ship was used basically as a torture chamber uh, by uh, the the Pinochet government in in the early seventies. Uh, at least one hundred ten political prisoners were interrogated aboard the ship, uh, and so I leafleted uh, outside uh, the ship. And apparently, uh, the word is that the FBI investigated some of the protesters against uh, the ship. In addition, uh, at Brandeis, uh, um, there is a, a big in uh, initiative to uh, disinvest from uh, South Africa. Uh, I had a, a meeting from with the uh, president of the, of the school uh, who went around from to apartment to apartment for the kids, uh, for the students to just build relationships. So one of the questions that we asked him was, well, does Brandeis have any investments in companies doing business in South Africa? And he said, yes. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Angela, da Angela Davis visited. Uh, she was brought in by the student government and she was a former graduate of Brandeis. So uh, and uh, she made a presentation and then asked, what well, does anybody know whether Brandeis has a, uh, investments in South Africa? And I raised my hand and that was that, the start of a campaign that uh, lasted for quite a few years. So. My next school was the University of Pittsburgh School of Public of International Affairs where I studied international development and rural development. Uh, what you see here is uh, a button that refers to uh, Anita Bryant and the fact that uh, she was leading an anti-LGBT uh, uh, campaign in Florida. And so um, I joined one of the demonstrations that took place in Pittsburgh. Another issue that I dealt with when I was at the university uh, was um, dealing with a couple of uh, Supreme Court cases. One of them was the Bakke case, and the other one deal dealt with the Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois. For the, fir for the first one, the Bakke case, uh, Supreme Court said that affirmative action should, be, should take place at the universities 
but uh, quotas were not acceptable. The second one for the Nazi Nazis versus Skok Skokie, uh, it prevented uh, uh, the the uh, the village of Skokie from forbidding a march by members of the Nazi parties. And Skokie was a heavily Jewish uh, community with Holocaust victims. And I supported both of these decisions uh, and uh, in the school newspaper. So this is my my article that I, came, I submitted to them. Uh, that was very controversial among everybody in the school. So. Uh, I went on uh, later in my life uh, uh, to uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government. I was sponsored by uh, my agency, U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, and I was inspired by uh, my a professor who uh, taught political economy. Uh, his name's Paul Collier, and he's become, uh, since then, an extremely uh, rep, uh, well, uh, well accepted uh, professor and uh, in dealing with particularly uh, the political economy of Africa, as well as other issues. And these are some of his books. Uh, the Bottom Billion is you know, about the poorest countries in the world, and uh, it really has become a stand, a classic in the international development field. And actually, he's been knighted in Britain, so his work has been recognized. All right, let's move on to my work life. Uh, in 1977, I did a internship to a certain degree uh, with a group called the National Community Land Trust in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the, the community land trusts have become quite well known, but uh, I worked with basically the pioneer of the community land trust approach. His name was Bob Swan, and um, he was not only a community land trust pioneer, but he also was a peace activist. Uh, and um, he was a conscientious objector during World War II and in prison during that time. And 1969, he and other civil rights activists founded New Communities Incorporated, which is a 5,600-acre land trust in Lee County, Georgia. So what it does is it secures the long-term community land ownership for landless Southern blacks. And that was sort of the basis of community land trusts everywhere. Uh, and um, his work, uh, the community land trust was based on its, some of his research uh, dealing with uh, the Jewish National Fund land trust in Israel, the work of the American political economist, Henry George, who believe that uh, the economic value of land should belong equally to all members of society and focused on uh, putting in place a single land tax. Um, and then also uh, m movements in India, the Bhutan movement, the Gramdan movement, all of these inspired the community land trust, which you know, had been used basically to assure that poor people can have access to the land. Uh, it makes sure that uh, those who are renting can move towards a long-term lease of their land, of their, of their property. So my work uh, for them, for the National Community Land Trust Center was to organize a brigade approach for young people to participate and support these community land trusts. And, I based it on some of the efforts uh, of uh, Jewish youth to come to Israeli kibbutzim. My next internship, this was part of my graduate program, was with the US Department of State, the Office of Food Policy. And one of the things I did there was, I was the liaison with the President Carter's Hunger Commission. And Participating members of this commission included Norman Borlaug, who 
is fa famous for the Green, the Green Revolution, Bess Meyerson, Harry Chapin, and John Denver. And I saw all of them, uh, and I made recommendations. Uh, I, I made um, a study of the hunger lobby, which I shared with them. The Office of Food Policy at State Department, one year later, was administering the grain embargo against the Soviet Union, which was put in place because it's of its occupation of Afghanistan. So that's one reason I was interested, given that I was uh, concerned about the use of food as a political weapon. In, uh, yeah. In 1980, I started a 29-year career with the U.S. Agency for International Development. I worked in administering the Food for Peace program, uh, all, I, overseeing all of the uh, USAID programs overseas in particular missions, as well as working as a, uh, as a democracy officer. The Food for Peace program was set up in 1954, actually before USAID, and it takes uh, uh, so-called surplus American food and sends it over overseas for uh, four different purposes, humanitarian uh, development, uh, market development, and foreign policy objectives. And so I was involved in all of those uh, objectives in my work overseas dealing with food for the food aid program for the first 10 years. My first two years with USAID uh, were in Senegal, and I was doing some monitoring of an emergency food distribution program. And you see, you know, some of the some of the food here. Uh, and um, one of the events that took place when I was uh, in Senegal was uh, the the visit of Vice President Bush. This was the Reagan Bush era. Uh, and um, when he came, uh, I was one of the couriers taking documents back and forth. And I uh, happened to provide him with the notice that uh, Brezhnev had died. And so he was in Senegal. And as vice president, he was required to go to Brezhnev's funeral. And uh, so he immediately got on a plane and went to Moscow. But they had to send another plane with his cold clothes, uh, his, his clothes for cold weather, so. In uh, 1984, I was uh, in Washington uh, and overseeing uh, food assistance to Africa. And one area that where it appeared to be uh, an increasing amount of hunger was in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, I was uh, asked to travel to Ethiopia to check it out. And I arrived in October of 1984 uh, and uh, went on a plane that was furnished by the Marxist military regime of the Ethiopian government, who was very interested in um, pointing out uh, the oops, the um, the problems that were occurring, but hadn't where there hadn't been significant response by the world. Uh, and uh, this is these are some of the scenes that I saw in a town called Quorum. Uh, Ethiopia was hit by not only a severe famine of many years, but also a, uh, they were in the middle of some military conflict. And these were some of the displaced people uh, who uh, were uh, congregating for potential to receive food. So, um, oops, let me go back. So uh, you'll see this is, how they received the food. This is the situation, the status of some of the, the children, enormous numbers of people there. This is where they were allowed to live. 
Uh, and this is me visiting another area in Ethiopia, in southern Ethiopia, which was also hardly um, hit pretty difficult. Um, after the response, uh, I just, uh, uh, one of the responses was uh, the provision of tents, and this was by uh, a group in Israel, and there's a uh, sign in front of it that says, from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem with love. So I arrived uh, just days before the BBC came and provided a uh, coverage of what was going on there. Uh, and so I was in a state of shock because I hadn't really you know, heard that the situation was so severe. I want to play, with, play for you uh, the BBC coverage of this. And it really changed uh, the world, and it seems to me, that uh, there was uh, uh, the response of musicians in the U.S., uh, uh, they, the song We Are the World, there was Band-Aid or Live-Aid, and by Bob Geldorf, uh, and p people became extremely aware of uh, the need to, uh, to respond to the famine in Ethiopia. So, see if I can put that on for you. In Ethiopia, seven million people are threatened by starvation. Thousands have already died. The famine caused by drought is the worst in living memory, and now the rains have failed again for the third year in succession. The relief organizations are doing all they can, but there just isn't enough food to go around. One of the worst hit areas is in the north of the country, where the problem has been complicated by two secessionist wars in Eritrea and Tigray. 40,000 refugees have converged on the town of Coram in the hope of getting some food and medical aid. Our correspondent, Michael Burke, has been back to Coram after four months, and he found the situation far worse. Dawn and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Coram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. Thousands of wasted people are coming here for help. Many find only death. They flood in every day from villages hundreds of miles away dulled by hunger, driven beyond the point of desperation. 15,000 children here now, suffering, confused, lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. Coram, an insignificant town, has become a place of grief. The relief agencies do what they can, Save the Children Fund are caring for more than 7,000 babies. Every day they weigh them on a sling, then compare their weight with their height. By this rule of thumb, one in three is severely malnourished, starved to the point of death. This morning, another 114 babies have arrived. The choice of who can be helped and who can't among the constant stream of newcomers is heartbreaking. There's not enough food for half these people. Rumours of a shipment can set off panic. As on most days, the rumours were false. For many here, there would be no food again today. Two months ago, there were 10,000 people here. Now the latest harvest has failed, there are 40,000. There's nothing like enough food in the country, not enough transport to move it if there was. These people have waited all morning. They want food, they're getting clothes. Those naked and most needy are marked by a pen stroke on their foreheads before the distribution begins. An armed guard sits on the small bundles of cast off clothing sent from countries in Europe. A few jackets, trousers and sweaters, once worn in the wealthy West, now handed out to starving people who have to live in the open through nights when the temperature drops to little over freezing point. Today, only a tiny amount of grain is being given out to those who have brought in firewood. People scrabble in the dirt as they go for each individual grain of wheat. For some, it may be the only food they've had for a fortnight or more. The Ethiopian government tries to persuade these people to go home, but that would make death certain. Better to camp here. Some of the very worst are packed into big sheds. 
7,000 now, most apparently dying of malnutrition, pneumonia and the diseases that prey on the starving. This three-year-old girl was beyond any help, unable to take food, attached to a drip but too late. The drip was taken away. Only minutes later, while we were filming, she died. Her mother had lost all her four children and her husband. The situation is out of control. Whole groups are being ignored. These people have been without food for a month. A government truck arrived to pick up those most desperately ill and take them to the sheds that are already overcrowded. It was a quick and random affair. They took a handful, but hundreds here needed the food and shelter the sheds provide. Those left behind seemed at least as bad as those that were taken, clustering around us in a hopeless appeal for help. If nothing happens, I don't know what we are doing. Then. If there is no food, uh, the medical treatment is a nonsense. Giving drugs to the people, giving uh, injections, giving tablets. If they don't have food, it's completely it's quite not ridiculous because we are here. And how do you feel about the attitude of the rest of the world to this country? I am not a politician. I don't care at all about what's going on. Just I am a witness of Korem. And I know that if nothing is done, there will be thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who will die. Already we have thousands here. Only Korem. And Korem is nothing in Wolo. And Wolo is not the only place in Ethiopia. Those who die in the night are brought at dawn to be laid out on the edge of the plain. Dozens of them, men, women and children, under blankets or bound in sackcloth for burial in the local custom. For two hours, the bodies kept coming from out of the encampment. This mother and the baby she bore two months ago, wrapped together in death. As body after body was brought down, the grief became almost tangible. By quorum standards, it wasn't a bad night, 37 dead. Tomorrow, there would be more. The day after, more still. Once the bureaucracy of death is over, the bodies are picked up to be carried back to the villages they left in hope such a little time ago. A tragedy bigger than anybody seems to realise, getting worse every day. Michael Burke on the victims of the famine in Ethiopia. And reaction to that report... So there were some in the U.S. administration at that time that said, well, we shouldn't respond because uh, people who f suffer this fate will revolt against their terrible government, and that probably would be a good thing. Uh, there, That was a minority viewpoint and quickly overcame. Uh, I was in a situation where I could put together a strategy of response, and uh, I helped uh, organize a uh, food uh, distribution program of hundreds of thousands of tons by lots of different organizations. Uh, the government itself of Ethiopia, the World Food Program, CARE, Save the Children, Catholic Relief Services, Mother Teresa's Sisters of Mercy, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, as well as the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. 
Uh, and uh, that didn't cover all of the areas that we needed to cover in Ethiopia because several areas were under the control of rebel groups. And uh, we couldn't rely on uh, the Ethiopian government to, to uh, provide food there. The other organizations had an almost impossible chance of, of getting in there. So instead, we worked with non-governmental organizations and relief groups of the liberation groups that were, in, uh, that were fighting in the rebel territories. So we would, we sent food uh, via Sudan to uh, into the, uh, the, the rebel controlled areas of Eritrea and Tigray. And as you've heard in the news, uh, the fighting is back again in Tigray. Uh, so, you know, the problems go on and on. Uh, even though the government has definitely improved significantly. And I should also say that for those of you interested that this was also the time of uh, the uh, operation to send the uh, Ethiopian Jews to Israel called Operation Moses. And so I uh, made touch with the, uh, some of the people who were organizing that, that uh, evacuation. And it was very challenging. Basically, the, the Jews were in the, pretty close to the, the, the areas of conflict and famine and they were led out into Sudan along with some of the refugees. So I'm going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, move to another program that I was involved in, and this was food, food assistance to the Afghan Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviet-controlled Afghan government in 1987, um, the U.S. Uh, supported the Mujahideen uh, from 1979 to 1989. And the story goes that in 1983, after a visit to Afghanistan, uh, Congressman Charles Wilson, Charlie Wilson, from Texas, uh, uh, began procuring billions of dollars of weapons for the Mujahideen. <clears throat> and he coordinated the shipment of these weapons through the Pakistan Intelligence Service. It's called the ISI. That also included the Stinger missiles, which were quite important in bringing down the Soviet regime there. And his exploits were documented in this film, Charlie Wilson's War, which is really fun to watch. But um, it is, uh, it just shows that uh, the U.S. through relatively secret means uh, uh, supported uh, all of these Islamist uh, warlords uh, to, to make life difficult for the Soviets. So, as part of that, of the support for the Mujahideen, uh, there was a program put together to provide food assistance in areas controlled by each of these warlords. Uh, and um, I was uh, overseeing this program from Washington. And I was asked to go out to uh, Pakistan, the uh, city of Peshawar, uh, to determine whether the program uh, merited any increase. Uh, and so when I went out there, I saw uh, the food that was being uh, transported by Pakistan intelligence to at least the border. Uh, and uh, I saw a film of the beneficiaries eating the food. But it turned out the beneficiaries were the Mujahideen soldiers. And I wasn't particularly happy with that. So I went back to Washington and I said, technically, 
this program could be doubled in size. However, there is absolutely no humanitarian or developmental reasons for approving it. But if you want to approve it for foreign policy reasons, go ahead. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to advocate for that. So in fact, that's what they did. In, from 1988 to 92, I was uh, living and working in Morocco. Uh, and one of the things that I was responsible for was uh, doing an audit of the food that had been used by Catholic Relief Service for its program over 20 or 30 years. And uh, uh, I was able to find that there were no, no real big problems except for the fact that at one point, they used it to help construct a fountain in a mosque, uh, as well as a bathrooms or toilets in a prison. So I made them aware of that. Uh, I think I just lost, uh, did I? Checking, okay, I'm back. So, so, but the big issue when I was in Morocco was getting married, and so, what you see here is uh, my uh, en engagement when I asked for the hand of my wife, Bushra, with her father over here. And I brought along a Moroccan friend just in case uh, he asked what religion I was, uh, and he didn't. And uh, I asked him, may I have the hand of your daughter in Arabic? and he responded, oh, take the whole thing. <laughs> we got married in Gibraltar because Morocco requires, uh, has no civil cer ceremony. I didn't want to convert. I didn't want to ask my wife to convert. Uh, so we went to Morocco for the ceremony. And then we came immediately back to Morocco for all the parties. And what you see here is uh, my father uh, and my mother uh, during the henna party. Uh, so you see my wife, my my mother with her feet all henna and hands. And, um, and then we held uh, the wedding ceremony at my house, bringing in the bride here with her parents and sister. Uh, and you know, even though. This was technically an illegal uh, marriage in Morocco. Um, my wife's brother, uh, Khalid, is a journalist, and he managed to get a, an announcement of our wedding uh, in the newspaper. So this, this is the, the announcement. So it's... Uh, Contradictions, I should say. One of the programs that I oversaw in Morocco was uh, the uh, the one that was uh, managed by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, uh, and it dealt with distribution of food to Jews around Morocco, um, which I had some issues with because I don't think that it's appropriate that you should only give to Jews and not others, just like you shouldn't give to Muslims and not Jews. So. But nevertheless, I got to know the Jewish community around the country. And as a result, uh, I've put together website, a website for those who want to visit Morocco and see it and understand it from a Jewish perspective and its culture. This is the second round of the website, I first put it together in 1999 uh, and um, includes uh, uh, 135 pages uh, about Moroccan Jews, Jews in Moroccan history, the role of Jews in Moroccan society, Moroccan Jewish culture, the, the Jewish emigration from Morocco, uh, the Moroccan Jewish diaspora in Israel, Canada, South America, et cetera, France, sites of Jewish is, is interest, planning a visit, and social media, et cetera. So 
it's getting a lot of hits these days. And here's the website uh, URL. Okay. In 1993 to 1997, uh, I served in Mali in West Africa. Uh, and um, one of the programs that I was uh, responsible for was what we call a, a demobilization program or and a reintegration program for the rebels in northern Mali, the Tuareg rebels, uh, which you see here. And they had come to an agreement with the Malian government uh, and um, they had, uh, um, the United Nation was uh, helping to, uh, uh, to support this agreement. One of the commemorations of the agreement uh, was a symbolic burning of weapons, they call it the flame of peace uh, that took place in Timbuktu. And um, the program that uh, I helped uh, support was a, a $2 million contribution from, from USAID that um, helped uh, 9,500 ex-combatants start up different projects like stores and farms uh, that would just help them transition to civilian activity. And um, you see here some, some images of Timbuktu and, and Mali. So uh, uh, while I was in uh, uh, Mali, uh, I, was, I found in the newspaper a, um, an article that was put together uh, by a group in Timbuktu, and it was uh, the the um, <coughs> manifesto of the Jews of Timbuktu, and it was a group of Muslims who recognized uh, that they had Jewish ancestries, and were very interested in celebrating it. So, for many years, I was lecturing at synagogues and other organizations uh, about uh, the Jews of Timbuktu and the fact that there are Muslims who recognize that their ancestry is Jewish. In 1999, 2000, I was overseeing assistance to the former Soviet Union from Washington. And um, I still don't know why my photos turned sideways, but um, I may, as part of that, I did a, an evaluation of a food aid program that the U.S. supported in Russia. And uh, my trip included a trip to the Russian Far East, a town called Magadan, which was uh, the home of uh, the gulags. And... Uh, I was, um, there's some commemorations of it. Here's a, a statue that is commemorating the gulags that were there. And they have a museum that focuses on the gulags. And this is a memorial of the visit of Vice President Henry Wallace, who visited the area in, during World War II, 1942 to 43, and uh, was uh, snookered by the Soviets who, who um, told him that all of the prison camps had been closed down. And he thought that everything looked fine, uh, but only afterward did he realize that uh, you know, he'd been taken for a ride. Uh, during that time, uh, when I was overseeing the, the Eurasia office, uh, I also oversaw program, programs in Ukraine and Moldova and Belarus, as well as Central Asia. And a lot of it focused on anti-corruption, as well as uh, dealing with conflict. I went on in 2004 to Egypt, and uh, I was the democracy officer in Egypt. And I was actually the first person 
to actually run what they called a democracy office because everybody before me was afraid to use the term. Uh, they called it the governance office. And the Moroccan government was extremely upset under Hosni Mubarak uh, with any sign of outside support for programs that would make the government more accountable. And so um, there were lots of programs that I helped start up there, many of them with the government, uh, focusing on criminal justice, family justice, decentralization, local governance, media, human rights, and violence against women and children. But the novelty was that I helped start up programs that were done without the approval of the Egyptian government. And these included uh, election monitoring, uh, promoting the political engagement of youth, women, and the disabled, using media for civic education, defending journalists, promoting freedom of information, providing legal assistance to the poor and the vulnerable, cultivating human rights activists, strengthening civil society oversight of government, uh, increasing participation in local decision making, and building a human rights culture. And um, for this, uh, my office received an award from the ambassador. Uh, and these are all the people who are involved in these grants uh, within the US Embassy or USAID. I also received a departing gift from the head of the National uh, Human Rights Council, who was Dr. Boutros Boutros Gali, the former Secretary General of the UN. Uh, he, this was a national, I mean, Egyptian government group that was sort of semi independent. So he wrote, gave me an award. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, those who received the grants did not receive a reward. A reward. Uh, they received prison. Uh, in 2011, the Egyptian police uh, raided the offices of more than a dozen prominent NGOs including the International Republican Institute, these are American groups, National Democratic Institute, Freedom House, the International Center for Journalists, and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. I was in December of 2011, and they were charged with receiving foreign funds, operating without permits, and fomenting unrest in Egypt. They were tried in 2013, and they were convicted of felonies. Nobody went to prison, but you know this is just how Egypt treats its defendants in criminal cases. They put them in a cage. But those who left the country cannot go back. So there are a lot of, of Egyptians who left. The U.S. paid for most of the Americans to, to leave the country. Another feature uh, of, the, of the operating environment dealing with democracy was that there was a U.S. policy that prohibited U.S. government employees from interacting with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and Muslim Brotherhood was a major player in the politics of the country uh, at that time, uh, but we couldn't talk to them. Um, I found my way around that. I involved them in some of the programs that I didn't participate in. But the ambassador was very thankful, actually, that I was creative enough to find ways to do that. But, you know, we thought that, you know, this was not going to go anywhere. But as of, uh, as you recall, in 2011, there was the Arab Spring the uprising against Hosni Mubarak, his removal from power. Uh, I went to Egypt in March of 2011, even though I'd retired already from 
USAID. I was able to get back and visit with with many of the recipients of the of assistance that the democracy office at USAID had provided. And in addition, I had my opportunity to visit Muslim Brotherhood headquarters. And here's a photo of me with Muslim Brotherhood representatives to learn about what their concerns were finally. And they were very interested in fighting corruption. Um, but it was pretty evident that uh, you know, if there were elections uh, and um, that the Muslim Brotherhood would be the first to be put into power. On, uh, I decided that uh, I had some expertise on this issue. So I wrote a blog in 2011 that addressed the institutions of uh, democracy in Egypt and made the prediction that the Muslim Brotherhood would take power, and which they did. Uh, and I didn't predict that they would be removed in the same way that Hosni Mubarak uh, was removed. Okay, Washington, uh, I uh, was back overseeing the office de dealing with rule of law. And one of the things I supported was a rule of law assessment of Russia, which no surprise found that the justice system was not independent. But there are room, there's room like at the, uh, the, the, the um, peace courts uh, at the very lowest level for some activities. Eventually, you say got kicked out of Russia. And of course, the democracy program stopped there. I went on to uh, uh, in, uh, oversee a program dealing with uh, fighting corruption in Bangladesh, including training w women journalists. Uh, I did uh, oversaw a an assessment of anti -cor of corruption and anti corruption in Timor Leste in East Timor, made out of uh, former colony of uh, Indonesia. In, in Liberia, I, I took a look at uh, uh, corruption in the education system. And uh, one, one, you'd see here a photo of, uh, sorry, but to go back, uh, of uh, teachers having their documents uh, reviewed and found that two thirds of them had false training certificates. So they couldn't get rid of all of them, but they had to find some way of dealing with it. Uh, I did a assessment of rule of law in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as uh, uh, made a presentation to the, the, the bar. Uh, and you can see some of the courts that uh, uh, we visited. In Niger, in West Africa, I came back to USAID under contract and uh, I uh, presided over a, a program to discuss priorities of the citizens in the uh, Tuareg area of northern Niger, the town of Agadez. There was also a uh, training of women parliamentarians. And then we had the visit of, uh, of um, Second Lady uh, Biden uh, because uh, she was uh, she went on a visit to Niger and I oversaw uh, her uh, the organization of her trip there. I did a uh, assessment of uh, democracy in Tunisia uh, after the Arab Spring and whether there was prospects for democracy to grow or retreat. And we saw as of last week that it's very much in retreat. I did a democracy assessment of Moldova uh, and uh, found that uh, there were severe concerns about uh, enormous corruption, as well as intervention from uh, the Russians. Uh, but as of now, the, the Moldovans have a European-leaning government and have been considered for 
entrance into the European Union. How are you actively involved now in your um, concerns, world concerns? Uh, well, I just completed an uh, assessment of citizen security in Haiti, and that inc that was done virtually. So I uh, interviewed the the gang leaders, the police, uh, the judiciary, uh, the media, uh, and they and in order to put together that report. And I'm in the midst of preparing a, a another study of uh, the uh, effect of corruption during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, in countries around the world and how they reacted in terms of modifying their programs. So uh, that's all done vir virtually too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tammy, I see you on Zoom. If you can unmute and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask you, Rick, uh, in overall, after so many uh, years of uh, being involved and doing all these assessments and assisting the social uh, community in various countries, how do you think, evaluate the effectiveness of those involvements, which are actually involvements of the West in the development of uh, other countries that are not considered uh, today as West countries? <coughs> Yeah, that's a, a big question, and uh, it can be answered in hundreds of thousands of ways, depending upon what type of assistance has, has been provided uh, and how you measure it. However, in my approach is sort of a political economy approach, and you know, I think of, uh, for example, the amount of assistance that was provided to Egypt, which was hundreds of millions of dollars uh, after the Camp David agreement. And uh, each of the money was spent on you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of, of, of projects and activities. But the real measure, Tammy, is whether there was peace. And so there was peace. So, you know, that's an important measure, but you know, each of these programs and activities uh, have to be looked at separately. And some of them, you know, work quite well in the short term and have some mixed uh, impact in the medium or long term. And that's why there are evaluations and assessments. Thank you, Rick. I'd just like to say, I always thought you were so quiet and unassuming and modest, but I can't imagine this world without you. So thank <laughs> you for all your work. Thanks so much.